All right, welcome everyone. Okay, to BOX that's every Thursday. This week, this week we have Don Petman from Utah State, and we trick the system because he's also an IOT. He's also an IOT speaker, so we have back to back IOT speakers. But him being so close by the center, it was just as better for inviting directly than going to the IOT request. So we get two out of, uh, of the same semester, which is unusual. Uh, Don got his Bachelor of Geology from Carlton College and then went to UC Santa Cruz, where he got his PhD. Uh, working on carbon chemistry on the PETM before going to Yale University as a postdoc and then joining Utah State in 2020. So, right, right, right for the pandemic. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, he got sailed in at least one that I know, I would be expedition. Three, I know, yeah. Three. And today we'll be talking about the carbon and silica cycle during the Cenozoic. Okay. All your things are for clothes. Um, I, I'm embarrassed to just point out to me that this talk is labeled Virginia Tech, where I was two weeks ago. And I did make a new version, but then I copied the wrong one for one code with the USB stick. We're trying to get this working. I, I changed some things, but I can't remember what I changed. So this will be a little bit, there might be some non sequiturs here. But um, I don't, the topic is the same, and that is that we talk about carbon silica cycle coupling during some enigmatic. Early Cenozoic warm periods. And this is, people are asking, this is a, a nice uh, image of a radiolarian, a siliceous microfossil with probably a few hundred micrometers uh, across made of biosilica. And that's uh, the geochemical archive that we can be using to talk about the coupling between the carbon and silica uh, cycles during these Cenozoic warm periods. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so I'll just, I'll. I'll introduce the silicate weathering feedback, which is the coupling between the carbon and silica cycles that I'll be exploring. And then I'm going to look at that coupling in two events or two warm periods the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, or the PETM, um, and then this comparatively lesser known uh, and more enigmatic warm period called the Middle Eocene climatic optimum, or like LECO, about 40 million years ago. I'm going to be using a relatively unexplored geochemical proxy for ancient silica cycling, which is the concentration of germanium in siliceous microfossils from deep sea sediments. And uh, we're gonna do an exercise and compare and contrast, that I think makes some uh, important insights into potential roles that silicate weathering can play um, in ancient warming events and even in our future. Okay. Uh, so, what is it? Press with the mouse, okay. Um, I'll begin by pointing out something that has been pointed out for many, many decades, which is that um, it's a little interesting, right, that Earth has remained habitable for life and for liquid water for far more than 3 billion years, which is kind of interesting in, uh, in light of the fact that we know that there's you know, these big increases in solar insulation from our own sun, um, plate tectonic cycles, uh, large igneous province volcanisms, things like asteroids uh, hitting the earth. Um, and each of these uh, forcing, these perturbations, some of them cause extinctions, right? but there's always uh, recovery afterwards. Um, so it's been, you know, we've agreed for, for many decades now that some process in your system must be moderating Earth's climate um, to maintain surface conditions favorable for life in the face of uh, three billion years of this quite chaotic uh, history. Um, and it's been uh, proposed for almost as long as, as we've known the above that this thermostat, this uh, moderating feedback in the Earth system, um, might have something to do with the greenhouse gas composition of the atmosphere, um, particularly the role of silicate weathering in regulating atmospheric CO2 levels. So let's step through um, what I mean by silicate weathering. So silicate minerals in Earth's crust react with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and meteoric water, uh, you know, rain and, and groundwater, um, to, to weather, chemically weather or dissolve uh, those silicate minerals. And um, 
So apologies to petrologists here. I'm using calcium silicate melasinamide as sort of a stand-in for the huge variety of silicate minerals that exist at Earth's surface. Um, we use melasinamide to make the stoichiometry of the falling balance reactions much simpler. Um, but this does a pretty good job of, of uh, capturing the, the relevant characteristics of the way that these silicate minerals weather by reacting with carbonic acid, such as carbon dioxide and rainwater. In the case of melasinamide, it congruently dissolves into uh, really aqueous forms of uh, cations, so it's about um, dissolved silica, and dissolved inorganic carbon, that's bicarbonate on that. Um, and two of those uh, products of silicate weathering are the building blocks of calcium carbonate, calcite protagonized uh, uh, shocks that, that oftentimes form in marine environments, right? Um, and so you know, those products are washed by groundwaters and the rivers and into the ocean for the most part, unless you live here in northern Utah, right? Um, where they form chemical sediments, um, most importantly calcium carbonate, right? Uh, and this, these reactions have to balance on long time scales in order to avoid massively oversaturated oceans with respect to calcium carbonate or critically undersaturated oceans. We know from so the history of carbonate sediments, neither of those cases has, has really existed, at least not for long geologic time scales. Now, the other product of most silicate weathering reactions is dissolved silica, right? The silicic acid here. And that is what um, things like that beautiful radiolarian I showed in the title slide make their bioskeletons out of. Um, we have a siliceous sponge that doesn't say there's a selection of radiolarian microfossils, right? So that product is loaded in the ocean where it fuels the production of bur a burial of uh, siliceous sediments, right? Biosilica, aka opal, and it's a diagenetic product eventually chert in marine sediments. Um, now, the, this set of equations does have to balance um, on long time scales. And if you balance the soil geometry, you get this really beautiful uh, balanced reaction that describes the, the relevant fluxes um, to the carbon and silica cycles quite nicely, where you, uh, starting with a silicate mineral, in this case, calcium silicate, you react it with uh, one uh, equivalent of CO2 in the atmosphere, and you bury it all as marine sediments. It's calcium carbonate sediments and biosiliceous sediments. Um, so at steady state in the long-term carbon cycle, the carbon dioxide to drive this reaction forward comes from the degassing of the solid earth. Right? All the CO2 that's coming out of uh, volcanoes and ocean ridges and metamorphic reactions as well um, in the crust, right? And uh, that CO2 uh, weather is silicate minerals and gets converted into um, carbonate sediments. Now, it also just so happens, and it's a very lucky thing for, for us and for uh, life on Earth, that the rate of silicate weathering, globally averaged, is thought to be responsive to changes in climate, right? That these reactions go faster when the conditions are warmer. Um, they're also, remember, water is a, a big, uh, uh, one of the uh, reactants in a lot of those equations. And so the intensification of the hydrologic cycle in warmer climates is thought to drive faster silicate weather. So here are some Estimates uh, for a variety of mineralogy of, uh, of, of the bedrock and certain catchments across uh, different atmospheric CO2 concentrations. So um, the warmer conditions on the right, uh, the rates of all of these different styles of weathering and different mythologies, uh, the, the normalized silicate weathering flux increases at higher carbon dioxide levels, uh, warmer temperatures, right? And so this sets up what we call the silicate weathering thermostat, um, this negative feedback in the long-term carbon cycle, uh, which you know, serves to moderate atmospheric CO2 concentrations and thus climate. The way that you can think of it working as in response to a perturbation, let's say someone was foolish enough to release a bunch of CO2 into the atmosphere, right? There's an increase in atmospheric CO2, that's gonna drive higher global surface temperatures via the greenhouse effect, and a more intensified hydrologic cycle. So those are both going to serve to accelerate the weathering of those silicate minerals, which of course consumes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere 
locking into marine sediments. And so that lowers uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration. So this feedback is a negative feedback because it, uh, it serves to counteract that initial perturbation of an increase in carbon dioxide levels. And vice versa, if the ocean process removes CO2 from the atmosphere, there's some secular cooling of the atmosphere. So the living rates would decrease allowing warming. Okay, so that's but the silicate weathering thermostat, and we're going to investigate the operation of the silicate weathering thermostat in these two um, early Cenozoic climate events. So uh, this record here is uh, one of the most recent stacks of uh, oxygen isotopes in benthic foraminifera. So an indicator of global temperature and ice volume from the extinction of the dinosaurs to today. And I've highlighted here this spike here is the PETM, the Paleocene Thermal Maximum. And this comparatively small little blip, uh, that warming there, is the MECO, the Middle Eocene Climatic Optimum. Um, and so let's learn a little bit about these two events. Um, so these, these events have some similarities and some differences. Let's tackle the similarities first. Uh, first of all, they're both warming events, right? There is perhaps no uh, more certain um, conclusion in the field of paleoclimate um, that things got quite a bit warmer during the PETM, right? We have this wealth of paleo temperature proxies, a variety of different paleo thermometers from all over the world um, that all confirm that the surface of the Earth got four or seven degrees uh, warmer right after the paleo-CMC boundary. Um, for the MECO, this event is a little bit comparatively less as, uh, studied in detail, but we now have several, um, at least, I would say a dozen or so paleo temperature records showing um, a little bit more modest warming um, of three to five degrees uh, surface warming or surface and deep ocean warming um, uh, in both hemispheres, high and low latitudes uh, over this time period in, in the Middle East in about 40 million years ago. Um, the second similarity is uh, right, so the PETM. We have um, one of the biggest fingerprints of the PETM in marine sediments is, uh, is the dissolution of calcium carbonate forming this clay lip I actually have here. My prop is this uh, sediment core. It's actually a replica. It's made of uh, artist clay or something like that. But this is a mock-up of what the PETM, the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, looks like at site 1263, I think. So this is actually... That photo right there, look at that, almost the same size. Um, and what you can see here is, this is up is, is this way here, below the Paleocene Eocene boundary, which falls right here, this light color reflects the fact that this is a bit of chalk. It's 95% calcium carbonate, like the shells of forams and chocolate forams. And this abrupt transition to darker color right here. This darker color is almost pure clay. There's zero weight percent calcium carbonate. Um, that then slowly, gradually recovers over uh, tens of centimeters, which is uh, tens of thousands of years, maybe just over uh, one or two hundred thousand years. Um, and uh, this, you know, cores like this have been recovered from all over the oceans. This is you know, one of the bigger printing hallmarks, hallmarks of the PE boundary um, all over the world. Uh, and uh, you know, we have cores from from a whole wide range of depths at this site in on the Wallace Ridge in the South Atlantic. These nearby sites span two kilometers of paleo depth. And so this constrains you know, that the area of, uh, of the absence of carbonate de deposition or dissolution of pre-existing carbonates, which we define as the carbonate compensation depth, right? The depth below which carbonates represent the sediments. We know that that CCD uh, shoaled by greater than two kilometers, which is like the biggest uh, rapid CCD shoal that we know of in the marine sedimentary uh, record. Um, now, the MECO has this in common with the PETM. The MECO is a carbonate dissolution event as well. Um, I don't have a core from the MECO, um, and it wouldn't look that spectacular if I did, because it's a longer time scale, uh, uh, not an abrupt transition. To a clay layer like we see in the PETM, rather this broader period of declining um, uh, and then recovering calcium carbonate mass accumulation rates across a wide range of sites from uh, at least the Pacific and the Atlantic in this compilation. Okay, 
Um, the third similarity I'll talk about is we now know um, from evidence from foreign isotopes and other uh, geophilical proxies uh, that the PETM was an, a decrease in seawater pH, right? An ocean acidification event. Um, you know, data has been compiled from a number of sites constraining the drop in pH at the PETM to be something like 0 0.3 pH units. And this sort of explains this clay layer uh, in these sediment cores, right? With ocean acidification, it had decreased the calcium carbonate saturation states, um, such that you dissolve, it's harder for calcite building organisms to make those shells, and you dissolve uh, this buffer of, of carbonate that you have sitting on the seafloor. Um, and so that all uh, fits together, right? It's, it's carbon dissolution with uh, ocean acidification, decreasing pH suggested by geochemical proxies. We now, as of a couple of years ago, we have uh, similar records from the MECO. So here's uh, surface dwelling ORM uh, pH reconstructed from their boron isotopes. And right concurrent with where we see warming, the oxygen isotope stack, you see this decrease in pH. It's a little bit, it's quite a bit smaller uh, than during the PTO, about half the size. Um, but nevertheless, the MECO is also an ocean acidification event. Okay, so we have those three things in common, right? Warming, carbon dissolution, and ocean acidification in PCM and the ego. But the, the similarities um, sort of stop there. Um, the one and maybe the most important difference between the PCM and the ego is that the PCM manifests as this massive excursion in carbon isotopes. So that's what in this benthic isotope record here, carbon isotopes jumping. Um, down several per mil, uh, we see this carbon isotope excursion in all sorts of records from terrestrial marine environments all over the world, from organic carbon and inorganic carbon. Um, this is like the geochemical fingerprint of uh, the PETM isotopically. That's the biggest, well, well yes, yeah, the biggest rapid perturbation at least since uh, the KT boundary that we found uh, in, in carbon isotope records from marine sediments. The MECO, on the other hand, um, there are some interesting long-term trends across this interval of a couple of million years bracketing the MECO, but there's no rapid, like, geologically instantaneous decrease in carbon isotopes that you see um, during the PETM. So it's different number one, difference number one. The next difference uh, is the time scale, okay? So here is a uh, carbon isotope excursion and the calcite content of marine sediment cores on a couple of different age models for the PETM. And um, you can see in both of these uh, data sets, there's a relatively rapid excursion. So the PETM onset happens quickly. And then there's, there's this brief period of uh, what we call the body of the event, particularly in carbon isotope uh, space. And then this more gradual recovery that happens over tens of thousands of years to maybe as long as uh, in the most generous age model, as long as 200,000 years. This, this event is over and done with, mostly over with by uh, 100,000 years and is uh, fully recovered, if you will, in a couple of hundred thousand years. The MECO, on the other hand, instead of this rapid onset of the PTM, features this gradual onset, this gradual warming over many hundreds of thousands of years, like the better part of half a million years, um, and then a comparatively uh, faster recovery. I mean, faster than the onset of the MECO, actually sort of on similar time scales to the recovery of, uh, of the PETM, right? So this whole event is greater than half a million years in duration. Um, so those are some, some important differences. So all the evidence put together for the, in the case of the PETM, including the rapid onset, uh, the carbon isotope excursion, allows us to, there's as near as consensus as you're going to find in this line of work, that the PETM is attributable, or let's say involves, um, the release of carbon into the uh, atmosphere ocean system, the exogenic carbon cycle, right? With a negative delta C13 signature, um, that's the Right, the increase in atmospheric CO2 levels, so you get warming, 
as the CO2 dissolves into the ocean, you get ocean acidification and dissolution of new and existing uh, seafloor carbonate. Um, various efforts to model this event using constraints from carbon isotopes and boron isotopes, and even just warming itself. People have estimated something like many thousands to a bit over 10,000 gigatons of carbon released you know, geologically rapidly, which means over likely over several thousand years. Um, and you know, the rapid onset and gradual recovery timescale of the PETM are consistent with this quick release, geological quick release of CO2, and then gradual recovery as the negative Earth system feedbacks, including on the longest time scale, silicate weathering feedback, bring the system back into something like the pre equilibrium um, driving the re recovery of this event. This explanation does not work for the Miku, right? The first reason is because the Miku doesn't have carbon isotope excursion. It's actually pretty tricky uh, to figure out where a bunch of carbon, you could put a bunch of carbon into the atmosphere without a negative carbon isotope excursion. You could, if you're really thinking outside the box, you could move carbon from the ocean into the atmosphere, um, but then you wouldn't get ocean acidification, carbonate dissolution, right? That's, that's not consistent with the, the records. So it's kind of just tricky to invoke a carbon release without any carbon isotope evidence for that release. Second, um, that's kind of more subtle, but the difference that gets the, the key of the enigma of Nico is that longer time scale, okay? And the reason that's a problem is that on, on time scales longer than tens of thousands of years, the, the half million years of the Nico, we carbon cycle modelers all agree that the silicate weathering feedback is supposed to buffer seawater carbonate chemistry against ocean acidification by just simple CO2 addition. All right, and so to, to demonstrate this, here is a suite of simulations done in, uh, in C Genies. This is Andy Ridgewell's Intermediate Earth System Complexity Model. And what they're doing is they're driving, they're adding CO2 into the atmosphere <clears throat> uh, to basically raise CO2 from uh, like a pre-industrial value up to whatever that is, 550 ppm over a range of time scales, right? So the red scenarios drive that increase over 10 years, and the deep blue ones do it over tens or hundreds of, or close to 100,000 years, right? And what you can see is in each of these scenarios, you can get a decrease in pH, right? So that's ocean acidification, strictly speaking, in, no matter how slowly you put this CO2 in. But looking at the carbonate saturation states of the ocean, right? You need fast carbon addition to get uh, seawater carbonation, carbonate saturation states to decrease to drive seafloor carbonate dissolution, like you see during the PTO, right? If you, if you drive that CO2 release slowly enough over tens of thousands of years, even over, in these scenarios, like over, um, you know, over the, you know, just a couple of tens of thousands of years, let's say, or certainly the hundreds of thousands of years of the Nico, that's so slow that the silicate weathering feedback, which is an important feedback in this model, keeps up with the warming, delivers more alkalinity, the building blocks of calcium carbonate, and you don't actually get a decrease in saturation state. And so by simple CO2 uh, injection, you don't get the carbonate dissolution that you do see during the media. You guys follow that? Time scale is wrong. It's too slow. Silicate weathering should keep up. Carbon release. So that model doesn't work. So uh, for about 10 years now, um, we've noted that the MECO is weird. Um, and the event was dubbed, I really love this paper by Atlas Slouch and some other people, um, the Middle East in Carbon Cycle Conundrum, right? And I love this paper because the, the thesis of this paper is just like, hey, everybody, look, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, and uh, we just, just point out that this is like a big problem in how we understand uh, the carbon cycle and how it responds to perturbations. And they sum it up with this, this line here that elevated temperatures, we see during the deco, should lead to an increase in weathering. You have the more alkalinity supply of the ocean and elevated carbonate saturation state, right? Not the, the, the dissolution that you see during the deco. So it's called the carbon cycle conundrum. 
Um, and this was uh, addressed in a subsequent paper with uh, so yeah, some of the same authors, that this could be um, because during the Middle Eocene, um, this warming was allowed to continue for so long and continue to drive dissolution because the silicate weathering feedback was weakened, was weakened, um, a diminished silicate weathering feedback uh, during this event. And some people have colloquially said, oh, this is evidence of a time period where um, perhaps even the silicate weathering feedback is broken during the MECO. It doesn't drive the recovery that it should. It just is a, a little step back and a little bit of motivation. So we're talking about silicate weathering these ancient events. Well, we're all also um, implicitly uh, assuming, hoping that the silicate <laughs> weathering feedback is going to be responsible for removing all the CO2 that we're currently putting in the atmosphere over geological time scales, right? And so if it's possible that sometimes the silicate weathering feedback is weakened or broken, we should probably like want to know why and when that is, and if it is currently operational or if it is broken. Okay, so um, so I got very interested in particularly with my focus on the Miko, what is the actual role of silicate weathering? How is it responding or, or interacting with the climate during that event? <clears throat> and um, I'm going to use this relatively, I would say, underutilized uh, geochemical tool that we have involving the concentration of the element germanium um, in silicious sediments. Uh, it uh, took me a long time to realize it's not germanium, that's flour. It's germanium, as in the country Germany, it's the element. And you see, it sits right below silicon in the periodic table. So it's, it's got the same number of like valence electrons in its outer shell. It's got a lot of the same chemical properties as silicon. And so germanium actually substitutes for silicon in very, very small ratios in basically all forms of silicon in uh, earth materials. So in silicate rocks, in the dissolved silicon that's in seawater, and in uh, the opal shells of organisms that make their shells out of that dissolved silica. <clears throat> and it offers an interesting perspective into ancient silicate weathering uh, because you can think of germanium silicon in the oceans as a two part mixture between two inputs. There's by far the largest input, which is the weathering of silicate minerals on the continents. And that has an extremely low germanium silicon ratio. This is uh, countered by a comparatively smaller flux from the hydrothermal alteration of seafloor basalts. Um, that's got, and then you know the fluids coming out of those hydrothermal systems have a very very high germanium to silicon ratio, right? And so the seawater value reflects a mixture of those two uh, inputs and. That is what is recorded by silicious microfossils. Right? These things, when the silicate, the germanium silicon ratio of seawater goes up, the germanium silicon that we record in things like radiolarians or diatoms or sponge pigments um, also go up. Okay. Yeah, so let's just think simple terms. If there was an increase in silicate weathering, right? This lower germanium silicon end member input gets larger, that would drive a decrease in the germanium silicon of seawater. And if the opposite were to happen, if there was a decrease in silicate weathering, then the seawater value would drift towards the much higher hydrothermal uh, germanium-rich uh, input value. Okay, so I uh, or strove to measure germanium silicate in silicious microfossils across these two events. And I'm gonna show you just two records uh, so far today, one from from each of these uh, these events. I have a PETM record from site 1258, that's on the deep sea drilling site on Denver Rise. Um, and then I have Nico sediments with radiolarians from the Tasman Abyssal Plateau, that's site U1511, that I sailed on seven years ago. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, so we get the sediments, we put them on a shaker table, save it out the sand size fraction, pick out under a microscope uh, tens or hundreds of these uh, morphologies of radiolarians. So these are a few hundred micrometers across. Um, and yeah, you get many of them, uh, crush them, and 
put them through a chemical cleaning procedure to try to remove any contaminant bases. And then we dissolve them in a, a strong base and uh, acidify them. And then we measure the ratio of germanium to silicon um, in the, the digested samples by, uh, by ICP mass spectrometry. Okay, so let's look at some results. We're jumping right in here. Okay, so this is the PETM record. Here is depth below the seafloor. This I put in here this is the boundary between the Paleocene and Eocene um, epochs. And uh, uh, right, so I think this is the part I deleted from the <laughs> talk. <laughs> but the, let's, let's, let's talk about these high points here. Right, so these, this is all the data, words and all. Um, those yellow points there, I would like to disregard. And the reason for that is we know um, from looking at these things under an SEM with, with like uh, with a secondary X ray detector that uh, the more poorly preserved radiolarian we can identify visually um, suffer from clay contamination in such a manner that the crushing and cleaning we do doesn't seem to remove all of the residual clay. This is like a well preserved rad. You get peaks in the EDS spectrum, silicon and oxygen, but the carbon is from the tape we use to put them on there. These poorly preserved ones, you see an aluminum peak, right? That's in aluminum silicates, and this grab bag of, uh, of cations, um, which I am interpreting as clay contamination, and that maybe should not be so surprising at the beginning of the PETM, because remember, those, those radiators come from this part here, this clay rich uh, horizon. Um, so here's at this site, um, this is weight percent calcium carbonate. And it's near zero where these uh, really high values come from. Um, and so, yeah, so for the rest of this talk, and maybe I'll feed your talks, I will <laughs> omit uh, those, those high values um, and, uh, and that, attribute that to clay. It also just wouldn't make sense. Like, couldn't drive a increase in the grain of silicon of seawater that quickly in the recovery. Those are just some, some outliers due to contamination. Okay, so let's look at the clean data here. So alongside, uh, here is the carbon isotope excursion invented borans at this site. And here is uh, a magnesium calcium boran derived temperature record that my grad student um, put together from this same site. Right, So right at the onset of the PTM, that's marked by carbon isotope excursion and warming, we see this subtle decrease in germanium silicon. Um, sorry. The, Decrease dry ice seems to start right at the onset and uh, follows, you know, certainly coincides with the warming um, as well, right? So, this allows a pretty simple interpretation. The silicate weathering and feedbacks are doing what we thought it would do. The PETM, warmer temperatures, increasing the rate of, uh, of continental silicate weathering, driving a decrease in the geranium silicon seawater as reported by our radio layers, okay? And this is also supported um, by uh, some, actually quite old now, uh, records of uh, osmium isotopes from the trial sediments over the PETM. Um, and actually, a little bit analogously to, geo, to germanium silicon, the osmium isotope composition of seawater uh, reflects a mixture of that sourced from uh, Continental weathering inputs and uh, hydrothermal alterations uh, from, from the salt. Um, and at the PECM, you know, one record for all that has been replicated elsewhere, there's this increase towards more radiogenic uh, osmium isotope, uh, which is certainly consistent with the increase in, um, in continental weathering during the PECM. Now, osmium isotopes on their own, also a little bit complicated by. Uh, you know, there could be a potential change in the silicate weathering input flux, right? Young volcanic rocks are especially unradiogenic, and so a shift to, uh, to a different type of weathering terrain essentially can change, drive a change in seawater, starting by stokes unrelated to uh, magnitude weathering. However, you know, the osmium isotopes and germanium silicon in close agreement. I think it's lent those credence to the idea that there were there was more silicate weathering during the PETM. And this makes sense, right? This is what silicate weathering feedback is supposed to do, um, where during warm periods there's higher silicate weathering 
drawing down CO2, driving the recovery of that event. Okay, so let's change gears and look at the MECO. And funny, this is all stuff that was work in progress by my master's student and now my PhD student, Ollie Lau, who generated all of this data from site 1511, the toe. And she's actually generated data from two different morpho species, morpho types, so say not species necessarily, um, of radial air in. And uh, so here are those results. Uh, applying them here against depth in uh, in below the seafloor, pictures of the core there. The shaded region is roughly where uh, we know from paleomagnetography that the Miko is. I'll point out that uh, you know there's this consistent offset between the two species of uh, of well, so two morpho types of radial area, the nasal area and spumal area, which was totally a surprise, and and um, we're still sort of trying to tease apart why that is. Um, but this offset seems remarkably consistent throughout the whole record, right? The nasal area are always just a little bit less than spumal area. And both of these species show the same relative trend through the event. Right? This discrete warmth, this axe right now warming, increase is remaining silicon right around there. So let's look at this on an age model against uh, some indication of uh, warming from the nearby site. So this is benthic oxygen isotopes. This is the gradual warming of the MECO, the peak here, and then recovery. And you can see that these, this increase in germanium silicon uh, corresponds quite closely with the peak MECO temperatures, right? It's higher germanium silicon ratios. So um, what? So on its face, right, this would uh, suggest, this would be consistent with an increase uh, in, or sorry, a decrease in silicate weathering during this warming event, right? So the opposite of what the canonical silicate weathering feedback would predict, right? If you're just interpreting these at face value, this apparently contradicts the expectation that during the warm period of the ego, there should have been an increase in the rate of silicate weathering. Hmm. Now, we also have osmium isotopes from uh, the MECO as well. And, oh, yeah, um, Ollie did something very clever, which is switch the direction of the axis of osmium isotopes here. So this is actually a decrease in osmium isotopes uh, concurrent with the warming of the MECO, reaching a peak around where germanium silicon has its, its, its high point. So that would, um, that's consistent with what we're seeing from germanium silicon, right? Consistent with the decrease in continental input of, uh, of, of the input of osmium isotopes during the MECO. And I'll just point out, okay, so I have on here lithium isotopes as well. I didn't say anything about lithium isotopes so far. Lithium isotopes tell us something about the style of silicate weathering. So how much of silicate weathering is uh, congruent, just dissolving uh, silicate minerals uh, delivering to the ocean versus Incongruent that is making secondary clays onto which the light lithium six uh, becomes absorbed. Um, but, anyways, we have records of lithium isotopes from both the PDCM and very recently the MECO as well now. And so, we have these three geochemical systems that we think are all are going to try and tell us something about uh, silicate weathering in the past. And each of these has uh, its own little pitfalls potential alternative explanations that have been advanced. But I think it's striking that if you compare records from the PCM and the MECO, each of these, germanium silicon, osmium isotopes, and lithium isotopes, do the exact opposite in the MECO that they do during the PCM, right? Mm -hmm. Germanium silicon goes down during the PCM, up during the MECO, osmium isotopes up during the PCM, down during MECO, and lithium isotopes, no matter what they're telling us, decrease during the PCM and increase during the MECO. So, I find the uh, coincidence of uh, these three systems, each showing the opposite trend, as uh, that's convincing enough to for us to seriously consider the possibility that the global silicate weathering flux really did decrease during the warming event of the MECO. And um, the way that I'm going to propose that this could happen is that during the MECO, Silicate weathering isn't acting as a feedback to warming, but rather changes in weathering 
independent of climate to begin with, are the driving force of the carbon cycle changes during the MECO. And the way to truly really understand this is to describe the MECO as an event of decreased weatherability, right? So the term weatherability covers all the, the characteristics of the Earth's surface that determine silicate weathering rates that are not related to atmosphere, atmosphere CO2 or uh, climate. So things like what types of rocks are exposed at the Earth's surface, how much uplift there is, and the rate of uplift to so apply new uh, fresh minerals to be weathered, constant local configuration, like we have all the continents in, in humid uh, rain belts versus uh, the poles, um, all those sorts of things, right? Uh, we know that this property can change over geological time, and this is thought to be you know, one of the uh, slowly changing boundary conditions that sets equilibrium CO2 and explains you know, the, the long time scale changes between greenhouse and ice house climates. <clears throat> So for the MECO, what I'm proposing is a transient decrease in Earth's weatherability during the MECO, um, where there's less weathering during the warm period of the MECO that allows carbon dioxide to build up in the atmosphere because less is being consumed by weathering, and that's what's driving uh, the warming. So let's step through this so quickly um, in a conceptual model of, uh, of the carbon cycle, let's say. Um, so. Uh, in this scenario, once something happens over hundreds of thousands of years for Earth's surface to be less weatherable, right? So there's a decrease in the silicate weathering rates. Um, that sets a, a, the imbalance in the carbon cycle, right? There's more CO2 being released from solid earth degassing and is being consumed by silicate weathering. And so CO2 begins to, to rise. That drives the warming. Um, of the surface and also the pH decline, right? As that CO2 dissolves in the seawater, uh, decreasing its pH. Um, after a few hundred thousand years, apparently Earth's weatherability returns to something like the pre eco state. And so silicate weathering rates catch back up to where they were. Silicate weathering rates um, increase uh, under that elevated CO2. So now the, the carbon cycle is imbalanced in the other way. Um, something like during the PETM recovery phase, there's more silicate weathering than CO2 being delivered to the uh, exogenic carbon cycle. And so that sequesters CO2, locking it into carbon sediments until the long term carbon cycle balance is restored. Okay. And I, I just want to also point out this is good news for explaining that long period of decreased carbonate burial during the week, though, right? Remember, silicate weathering is delivering the building blocks of calcite, marine carbonates, to the ocean. And so if you have a long period of depressed silicate weathering rates during the eco, get less alkalinity GIC being supplied to the ocean. So a period, a longer period of less carbonate buried in sediments. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I just said. Um, Great. So uh, I may, maybe you're with me right now, maybe you're not, but it's an interesting question. So what could actually what could actually be going on at our surface to drive a um, a somewhat rapid, you know, over several hundreds of thousands of years, half a million years, decrease in weatherability? It's a little bit awkward, right? Because there's no the intermediate time scale. A little bit closer, I mean, a little bit shorter than uh, truly tectonic processes um, that you think of. Um, but so I'm going to speculate wildly here for this slide. So, first of all, I'm going to point out that an increase in weatherability is invoked uh, by paleoclimatologists, mostly in, in deeper time, as uh, a driver of cooling and glaciation, like some secular change in, in elevated weatherability to. To decrease atmospheric CO2 and drive glaciation. So, if they're allowed to turn that knob down to explain cooling, I should be able to turn it up to explain warming, right? Um, more, uh, more specifically, let's imagine uh, a large orogenic system, right? Mountain building that's delivering fresh silicate, metallic, uh, silicate minerals to the surface to be weathered. If that orogeny stops rather abruptly, um, then that's going to cut off the supply of fresh silicate minerals on the surface. If you form a regolith, a soil or something over that mineral, that, that fresh mineral, so that's a decrease in, in 
flow will still take about 100 weeks. It's been pointed out that uh, there's some uh, some evidence, uh, not everyone uh, buys into it, that there was a, a modest sea level uh, rise, sea level rise during the Nico. That's just saying rise, not fall. Um, and of course, those authors interpret it as like, oh, this must be some small ice sheets melting during the warmth of the Nico, rather than sea level rise, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if this is uh, more secular, driven by some sort of uh, dynamic topography, you know, sea floor bulge type of thing, who knows? Um, then maybe you submerge, you drown some uh, weathering, some, some like highly weatherable terrain, you know, some tropical volcanic park, a mafic large decayed province, or it'll be like or something like this. Probably it's, it's kind of a modest, it's like a couple tens of meters to maybe so it'll rise during the eco. So I'm just, how much basalt can you really drown with 10 liters? Um, yeah, like I said, you know, forming a regolith or uh, a laterite sort of shield over something like an ophiolite, something really ultramafic, uh, locus of silicate weathering. Um, and also point out that the Miko happens, it was superimposed on this long term cooling trend over from like the early Eocene climatic optimum to the Eocene Eocene transition. And beyond. So maybe, you know, as cooling happens, there's reorganization of atmospheric circulation and the hydrologic cycle. So uh, you know, maybe that's just that redirects rainfall away from some highly weatherable terrain that would turn a, you know, a tropical basaltic weathering terrain into a desert. So I guess that would certainly be a decrease in weathering. Problem with that is, like, so why does it go back after 300,000 years? Anyways, it's entirely possible that, you know, maybe we never pinpoint exactly what part of the earth uh, becomes less weatherable. Um, but I will have for a couple more pieces of evidence in my favor here. One is that you would know, think of the Nico as this event, right? But this event doesn't happen against the stable equilibrium baseline. So let's keep bracketed by these two um, episodes of increased carbonate accumulation in uh, in sediment cores, they're named as CAE carbonate accumulation events, and then it goes right after CAE three and a little bit before CAE four. Um, so you need to think about like, well, what is what is the event and what is the could the Nico just be like a readjustment uh, in between those other forces? But anyways, if we're looking at carbonate burial rates through the lens of silicate weathering rate modulating these things, maybe CAE three and four are periods of intensified uh, silicate weathering, right? And that the MECO is this period of uh, those weathering, whatever source of intense weathering is going on that, those systems sort of just relax into their, their pre-intense weathering periods, right? That got a little tortured, but my point is the MECO being in between what I, I want to propose are intense weathering events makes it, I think, easier for the MECO to be like a pronounced decrease in weathering over a few hundred thousand years. And um, finally, you know that the Middle Eocene, right around 49, 40 million years ago, is actually a pretty dynamic time period in terms of global plate tectonics, um, particularly in the Pacific Ocean, right? I'm familiar with like the Hawaii Emperor Seamount uh, chain that has this bend in it right here that, you know, that, that is evidence of the overall direction of the North Pacific plate changing direction rather abruptly. Well, that bend is just a little bit prior, about 42 million years, um, just before the Miko. If you think about like accommodating that, um, the change in motion of the largest plate on Earth, right? There's a whole bunch of uh, convergent and divergent plate boundaries that have to readjust to accommodate that change. And I think it's, it's um, it's not impossible to imagine there being big changes in the rate and location um, relative to, uh, to, let's say, probably human belts of um, orogenesis, so the supply of, of mineral to, to the surface. So, uh, an ample opportunity for weathering weirdness. Okay, um, this is my last slide, I swear. And I just want to finish. By putting up. So these are sort of in that the silicate weathering feedback schematic 
Um, this is what I propose going on here in the PCM versus the MECO. PCM, the driving force is carbon release in the atmosphere. And then the thermostat reacts as uh, a negative feedback, mitigating that initial CO2 rise. The MECO, on the other hand, the forcing is in silicate weathering, right? The relationship between global climate or atmospheric CO2 concentration and silicate weathering. If you change that relationship, you can get, um, you can drive a, a change in atmospheric CO2. <clears throat> And I'll just point out, um, right, we talked about maybe the silicate weathering feedback being broken or weakened during the eco as an explanation. But if you look at these systems, it's the exact same system in operation in both of these events. The only difference is what part of the machine you're, you're forcing, like where you're putting um, the perturbation into. And so I don't think the silicate is evidence of a broken silicate weathering feedback at all. Um, it just it introduces some subtlety into, uh, and some flexibility into the, the boundary conditions of this feedback. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll uh, <clears throat> acknowledge uh, all these folks and uh, happy to take any questions.